Just when we finally got everyone saying ETL, some folks started talking about ELT. In this video, we'll view the difference between the acronyms from the perspective of a data warehouse. So let's start off by looking at two types of relational databases. OLTP systems are used to manage operations, and their database schemas use normalizing principles to reduce data duplication and ensure logical dependencies. Relational OLAP systems are used to mine insights from data, so they store denormalized data to make querying easier. The OL and P in both acronyms stand for online processing. The T stands for transaction because OLTP databases are optimized for transaction loading and updating. And the A stands for analytical because OLAP is used to perform analytics. So one is designed to rapidly push data in and the other is optimized to quickly pull data out. A database designed for OLTP will not function well as a source for analytics, so the operational data needs to be reshaped and copied into a relational OLAP database. A couple of decades ago, it was common for operational data to be stored in a mainframe database like DB2 and for the analytical data to be stored in a database like Oracle. Table data would often be dumped and denormalized into flat files and the extraction was often performed via COBOL programs. The load process had two steps. First, the files were copied into the Oracle server, and this was often done via a utility that used the file transfer protocol. The flat files were then loaded into Oracle staging tables, using a tool like Oracle SQL Loader, which would parse the delimited files and insert their data into relational tables. Now that the data was stored in the database, it could be transformed into a star schema's tables via SQL statements. In this case, using Oracle's PL SQL, which includes procedural language elements such as conditions and loops. When we look at the order of steps, we see that this traditional method was a form of ELT, where the data was extracted, loaded, and then transformed. But this was ELT before people started using the ELT acronym. Something important to mention is that the raw files and tables were usually temporary and were deleted shortly after transformation completed. It was too expensive to store the staging data, so analysts did not have access to the raw data. The fact and dimension tables that were updated from the raw data were queried when analysts ran ad hoc SQL and used BI tools. The problem was that both the transformations and the consumption were processed by the same server, so there was contention for resources like CPU and memory. And it was this competition for shared resources that ushered in a new architecture. An integration server was inserted in between the source database and the data warehouse. Software would read directly from operational tables, stream the data through to transform it in memory, and then insert it into the star schema, never landing data onto the integration server. Power Center from Informatica was an example of this type of software. Transforming the data before it was loaded into the target database was why the ETL acronym was coined. The relational OLAP server still processed analytic queries, but there was no longer contention for its resources because the transformations were processed on another server. Taking the transformation load off of your overutilized database server was the main selling point for ETL software but ETL vendors boasted other advantages over the traditional approach. The most important was that you created visual mappings via a drag and drop interface, and then the software automatically generated SQL based on your pictures. The vendor's position was that the maintainability and reusability increased because developers no longer wrote their own SQL statements. Fast forward to today, where new OLTP databases are created on more modern systems like MySQL and Postgres, 
and data warehouses exist on cloud platforms like Azure, GCP, and AWS. This modern architecture starts with a new breed of tools, like Airbyte, which calls itself an open data movement platform and focuses on securely extracting data from all your sources and reliably loading it into your data warehouse. In this example, data is copied into cloud object storage and converted into Snowflake's hybrid columnar format. We spin up a highly scalable Snowflake compute cluster and use it to transform the source data for our fact and dimension tables. This step is handled by another new breed of tools like DBT, which transforms data that has already been loaded into your warehouse. Since transformations occur after the extraction and loading steps, the new acronym is ELT. Unlike the traditional method where staging data is ephemeral, storing data in the cloud is significantly cheaper, so the staging data can be retained for analyses that require raw data. Since cloud databases like Snowflake use the separation between compute and storage technique, Consumption requests can be fulfilled by compute clusters that are not dedicated to performing transformations. And this is why ELT has become popular. Different workloads can run on their own compute clusters, so there is no contention for resources between transformations and consumption. Something you may have noticed is that since the raw data is stored in Snowflake tables, you could just perform the transformations via SQL select statements within Snowflake's own SnowSite user interface. So why would you use an additional tool like DBT? Vendors will tout the value-added features of their product. Unlike ETL tools, which used a graphical user interface instead of SQL, ELT tools like DBT sing the praises of using SQL because it has become so universally popular. DBT makes use of an open source template engine named Jinja, so in addition to SQL, your transformation logic can also make use of Jinja's internal features like variables, conditional if statements, and for loops. And recently, DBT also enabled the creation of transformations using Python code that runs on the target platform. I hope you now understand why you're starting to hear ELT more often than ETL.